let's now dive into respiratory mechanics of the spine. When we take a breath of air in, the ventral cavity, the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis ought to expand in all directions. And when we exhale, the ventral cavity ought to compress in all directions. From a spinal perspective, first off, let's note the normal curvature of the spine. The lumbar, or the sacrum should be kyphotic, or if this is the front, concave to the front. The lumbar spine should be lordotic, convex to the front. The thoracic spine should be kyphotic, concave to the front. The cervical spine should be lordotic, convex to the front. That's the normal curvature of the spine from a side view. When I breathe in, if I am going to make the ventral cavity expand in all directions, the forces from the viscera, air, and musculature should make the entire spine more kyphotic or more rounded. Think of the ventral cavity as a big egg that's expanding backwards. What that looks like is I get sacral counter nutation, meaning the sacrum tips backwards. When that happens, the lumbar spine, the lordotic curve reduces and it gets flattened. The thoracic spine ought to become more kyphotic, meaning it should move backwards as well. The cervical spine, that lordosis should reduce, so it should develop more flexion or a reduction in the lordotic curve. And at the OA joint or the head, it should tip slightly upward into OA extension, which opens up the airway. So as I breathe in, we'll go through that again. The sacrum counter nutates, the lumbar spine, the lordosis reduces, the thoracic spine, the kyphosis increases, the cervical spine, the lordosis reduces, and for the OA joint, the head tips backward into OA extension. That would be inhalation. And the reason why that occurs is because of the forces imparted as the lungs fill, as the diaphragm descends, as the pelvic floor drops, and the viscera and air pushes posteriorly on the spine, as well as muscular contractions from muscles of inhalation. During exhalation, that reverses, and the spine moves back to its normal state. Meaning, from the bottom, the sacrum goes into nutation. The lumbar spine becomes more lordotic. The thoracic spine becomes less kyphotic, meaning it moves this way. It tends to flatten, not completely, but it goes flattening towards its normal kyphosis and the cervical lordosis ought to increase, the occiput ought to flex. During exhalation, again, the sacrum nutates, the lumbar lordosis increases, like so, the thoracic kyphosis flattens, the cervical lordosis increases, moving this way, and the OA joint should flex. Let's now move into the pelvic movements and the lumbosacral complex from a normal respiratory mechanics standpoint. Let me orient you a little bit. Here we have the sacrum. This is that big bone right here. We have a few lumbar vertebrae. We have two anominates. We have the pelvic inlet, which is this top ring of the pelvis. And we have the pelvic outlet, which is the bottom ring of the pelvis. And then we have this angle right here, which is your infrapubic angle. Now remember, when we were discussing what the spine does, since the sacrum is part of the spine, as I breathe in, the sacrum ought to counter nutate, meaning the sacrum tips backward. If this is a side view of me, counter nutation, counter nutation, the sacrum tips backward, the bottom portion is going to come forward. 
due to the mechanics of the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint. So a sacrum moving on an ilium, which is part of the innominate. As the sacrum counternutates, the innominates ought to rotate anteriorly. So the combined movement, since there's only two degrees of motion available at the SI joint, looks like this. I get the sacrum tipping backwards into counternutation. The innominates rotate anteriorly and the pelvic inlet gets much larger. This is useful because as the diaphragm descends, the viscera, i.e. the guts and the goods, move downward and I need to increase surface area on the pelvis to be able to catch all that stuff. Again, during inhalation, the sacrum counternutates, the pelvic inlet spreads apart because of anterior SI joint rotation. At the bottom of the pelvis, you'll notice that the infrapubic angle narrows and the pelvic outlet closes or gets smaller. This happens because as the guts and the goods move downward, the pelvic floor descends. As the pelvic floor descends, if my hand were the pelvic floor, in order to drop this portion, the, the web space of my hand, I have to bring the fingers closer together. As I bring the outlet or the infrapubic angle closer together, that is the same phenomenon, leading the pelvic floor to descending to catch the goods. So to summarize, inhalation, sacral counternutation, which is also associated with a reduction of lumbar lordosis, anterior SI joint rotation, which increases surface area on the pelvic inlet to catch the viscera, the infrapubic angle narrows, and the outlet gets smaller, it closes. With exhalation, that reverses. When I exhale, the sacrum is going to tip forward into nutation. The lumbar lordosis is going to increase. Due to the SI joint mechanics, if the sacrum nutates, it moves closer to you. The innominates are going to posteriorly rotate this time, meaning they move away from the camera. As this happens, you'll notice that the surface area of the inlet decreases. This allows for the guts and the goods to shoot upward by the surface area decreasing. The combined movement should look like this, where the whole pelvis is tipping forward. At the bottom portion, as I exhale, the infrapubic angle widens because the pelvic floor is now ascending. The pelvic outlet opens up. To go over that one more time, during exhalation, the sacrum falls into nutation. That is associated with posterior SI joint rotation with the combined movement of the pelvis orienting anteriorly or moving forward. The inlet surface area decreases, the infrapubic angle widens, and the pelvic outlet surface area increases or it opens up. And that concludes normal respiratory mechanics of both the spine and the pelvic region.